Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Uh, I'm going to uh, be real straight and direct here today. There are some things I need to talk to you about. Uh, I think if you followed me for any time, you know I don't pull punches. I'm not here to entertain. I'm not here uh, to rub you smooth so you like me. I told you when I started this thing on social media over 13 years ago that I wasn't here to be liked. I wasn't here for uh, the shares and the accolades and to, to be praised. I was here to deliver truth. I was here to deliver hope. I was here to offer solutions. I was here to speak the truth and that I knew that at times the truth was going to rub some of you raw. I'm not here to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not here to attack anybody. Anybody that knows me knows that uh, I go out of my way to stay out of conflict with my brothers, even when I may be at odds with them, because I understand we're from the same blood and that if we start to beef, we divide our people. So I, I swallow a lot when I'm handled certain ways by certain people because I understand that this thing is bigger than me. But let me be clear here. We are failing miserably. And I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to tell you first and foremost, I'm here. Number one is because I need your help. Uh, I need uh, you guys to actually support the work we do. I, we, I need you to give. Uh, I need your help. We need to raise $2,500 today. Now, somebody's going to ask, well, what do you need $2,500 for? Well, I could go down a long laundry list, but let's just start with the fact that I've personally funded almost $80,000 of research. Nobody's contributed to the research. Without the research, we don't have an understanding. Without the understanding, we don't have the platform to build strategies. Without the strategies on the platform, we have no ability to develop programs that actually work. And without that, we don't have the ability to implement those programs. And guess what? The Odyssey Project does all of those things from black men lead to working with young ladies who come from incestuous homes, uh, sexual abuse as child, as children, excuse me, uh, mental health problems for men and women, uh, wraparound services uh, for men. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that somebody's not sitting here. If you paid attention to the conversation we had on the I Changed the Narrative podcast where we talked about building generational wealth you should also understand the depth that, that i've gone to understand our enigmatic issues that takes energy effort and time and i've done that what i'm saying right now is there are some things on deck that need immediate solutions that i shouldn't have to reach into my pocket and cover I've consistently pushed this thing and I will consistently go on, but I'm challenging. At some point, we've got to get out of this idea that complaining is contributing. We've got to get out of this idea that sitting around and talking and debating is somehow, some way solving the issues in the community. I can tell you because I literally just came from a walk in the community. Something I do often. I walk our communities and I walk theirs. I look at what 
other groups are doing and then I look at us and we are losing on every front. We're at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. The wealth gap is widening. We are being educated into an absolute stupor and we are just trusting the system to do right by our children. I've created programs to help our children. I created a socialization program for our boys. I've created a healing pro and therapeutic program and intervention process for our young girls. Do you realize that about 60% of our females have experienced some form of sex, childhood sexual abuse. That means before the age of 18, they were mishandled sexually by someone more than likely they knew. And even, uh, even more in most instances by someone they should have been able to trust to protect them. See, these are the, the uh, elephants in the room the lumps in the carpet that in the under the rug that we don't want to talk about but we can't get anywhere if we don't deal with it if we don't start examining what's wrong with us we're never going to be able to do anything to advance ourselves and i'm asking today that you go into the description box and give give for our research give for our think tank give for our programs for our youth boys and girls give for our mental health programs um and we are so far behind in that that it's absolutely ridiculous but we'll sit up and talk about everything that the white man is doing to us there's no if there's no enemy on the inside the enemy on the outside can do us no harm we're vulnerable because we are literally inundated with the cancer of envy the cancer of jealousy, the cancer of ignorance, the cancer of uh, hostility and bitterness. Uh, we are harming each other at an alarming rate. Do you realize that the second leading cause of death for black females between the age of 15 and 44 is intimate partner violence, intimate partner homicide? I've been talking about it for more than two decades. Uh, do you realize that the suicide rate in the black community has spiked 30% in the last five years? That's 30%. It's worse for young black males, 14 to 24. That's 49%. For the first time ever, blacks are leading in a statistical category in suicide. Our babies, 5 to 13, young girls, 5 to 13, are at the top. But we don't have anything that's urgent, right? We don't have any problems that's urgent. Oh, and then there is this ever uh, perpetually engaged BS battle between men and women in the black community. I don't need a man. It's the woman's fault. It's the black woman's fault. I don't need a man. All of it's BS. All of it is something that has been socially engineered into our behavior and our thinking. Am I saying what you've been through isn't real? No, I'm saying that it was engineered. I'm saying that the way you perceived it is engineered. I'm saying that the way that you're constantly triggered about it is engineered. When something hurts you, if you don't heal from it, it becomes a festering injury that impacts your ability to move function if you injure your leg and you don't allow your leg to heal well you won't walk well ever and that's the same thing with your psyche your, your, your psyche your emotions your spirit all of those things have the capacity to be bruised the capacity to be cut the capacity capacity to be uh broken and if you don't take the time to heal you'll be so focused on what one person did you'll see that person in every person you encounter and then if we keep breaking one another long enough, everybody will be broken and everybody will have a behavior that isn't conducive to building anything worthwhile. Again, I've written on that in Born in Captivity, Psychopathology is a Legacy of Slavery, my 19th book. I've written on it in The Undoing of the African-American Mind, my 23rd book. I've talked about the miseducation of our, our youth in my 16th book. And in my 24th book, Academic Apartheid. At some point, we, we have to get out of the idea that we can sit up on their platforms, complain, 
and actually something's going to happen. We have to get out of the mindset that sitting up and begging them to fix something for us is going to be the solution. At some point, we're going to have to get out of the mindset that we can guilt them into doing right by us as if they don't already know what they're doing. At some point, we have to take on the responsibility of creating a better environment for the generations that follow us. This is going to be a situation that if we're not careful, we're going to be the first generation to leave behind a world worse than the one that we came into because we won't engage the needs. We won't engage the problem. We won't look inside of ourselves and ask ourselves, what is it that I can do to change things? We don't want to get it we are risk everything we are risk stuff that we know is risky and it benefits them but when it comes to truly doing something for ourselves we'll talk black power but we won't execute it i'm sitting up in a and i'm walking uh communities uh a few days ago and i come across this apartment complex that's a nice complex but they are actually upgrading so I decided to walk through. All of the upgrades are being done by Hispanics. And so I go to another complex where they are, they're, they're doing the construction on. It's a new one. And I go in and all of the contract work is being done by Hispanics. And so... I revisit something I learned probably about seven, eight years ago, and I've been keeping up with it, is that there was a time that most construction companies here in Texas were owned by white men. Now, the vast majority of their labor were Hispanic men. They had the skill sets in carpentry and flooring and wiring and and, and, and plumbing and all of these other things that are a part of creating and building erections. And um, what, I, what I watched over the years were they went from applying to work at these different uh, white construction companies to saying, we'll come on as independent contractor. I'm a flooring guy, and these are, this is my team. I'm electrical. I'm electrical guy. This is my team. I'm a plumbing guy. I'm a I'm a drywall guy. I am a framing guy. All of these different things, and and they came in as independent contractors in those specific areas. And what happened is they had to come in. They came, in, but they came in as business owners, as independent contractors. What eventually happened is. They all came together and got together as a unified uh, uh, entity and started bidding against the white contractors. And now almost every contractor on these levels, where you're talking about home building, apartment building, and all that stuff in, in Texas, Hispanics. Simply understanding we get together, we work together, we build together, we operate together. Then when they realize, hey, they own this, but we are literally the skill. Without us, they don't do it. They decided we don't need them. We'll start by contracting with them. So now we're not employees. We are actually business owners. So we learn the business from a different perspective. We learn the front end and the back end of the business side of things. And eventually we just go in and we compete with them. And we can compete. Why? Because we control the cost because they can't put it any lower than we put it because we are telling them what we charge. It's so many ways we're losing. Because we don't work together, because we won't support one another, because we won't get into it. We, we want to show the whips we're driving. We want to show what we got. We so hung on showing how successful we are that we're not building the catalyst and the force and the foundation for truly experiencing power. Having a six-figure income isn't power. Having the ability to, to pay somebody a six-figure income is power. Yes, I need you. I need more than likes. I need more than, yeah, they're good. 
But you got to understand, I'm not here to get my ego stroked. So how many likes I get on you know, isn't that? Or I'll be doing something else. There are a bunch of things I could do that are more entertaining, more fun, and less stressful. But that's just it. Those things don't produce anything of intrinsic value. They don't produce anything beyond making people laugh, having something fun. It's going Now, it'll put money in my bank account. But I don't want that to be my legacy. Now, maybe I would do more fun stuff if all this other stuff was taken care of. But somebody has to be committed enough to sit up and say, we're going to do what's necessary. Somebody's got to hold it down. Somebody's got to do what's necessary. And the problem is everybody's talking. Nobody's popping. Everybody will show up here. And, and we get played over and over again. We get excited about stuff. We get upset about stuff. We have this infighting going on between us and don't realize all of this is being handled. Levels are being pulled. Buttons being pushed by the very ones we keep saying are working against us. No one knows the power of unity between the black man and the black woman like white people. It scares the hell out of them. <laughs> You have to understand at a very high level the dynamic of destruction at force at, uh, that's moving at full force throughout our community. The deception, uh, the miseducation, the volatility and vitriol that's being poured in the distrust that's being created. Am I sitting up and saying that we haven't done some things as individuals uh, and the collective that we should be really concerned about? Absolutely. I just said that we got a problem with incest. I just said we have a problem with intimate partner violence. But you got to say even a great deal of that has been engineered. I control your behavior when I control what you consume. When everything you listen to in the community is violence, when everything you listen to in the community is drugs, when everything you listen to in the community is misogyny, well, automatically, guys, you got to understand something. If everything being pushed is a misogynistic, misogynistic force in disrespecting women, guess what their response is going to be? Misandry. The man ain't shit. Without the black woman, the man ain't shit, and we don't want you anymore. That's the response. Do you not think that this is the actual case uh, of what they're trying to produce? This is what they are actually sitting up and orchestrating with great specificity by what they literally funnel to us? The push of the homosexual agenda will have a much greater negative impact on the black community than any other race, especially the white community. We can't afford it, but it's being pushed on us more than any other group, and we're the most likely to stand up and go to war for it, even if we are not necessarily for it, because we know what it feels like to have people not like us. And so we go to war for everybody, but nobody goes to war for us. At what point are we going to take that energy that we use to stand up for the people at the border, to stand up for the LGBTQ community, stand up for the Asians that were supposedly under such a great assault, to stand up for all the people who uh, uh, feel that they are going through some form of anti-Semitism? When are we going to take that and actually work on black issues? While white police officers are 71%, uh, or white, the killing of police officers is done 71% of the time by white men. Black men is who they fear, even when the black man is unarmed and more likely to be killed when unarmed. That's because there's a constant and consistent message that we're naturally violent, we're superhuman in strength, and we have the ability to kill with our hands. I 
I could go on and on, but at some point, it's our responsibility to sit up and say, you know what, I am not going to sit idly by and do nothing. Yes, I'm challenging you. The goal today is 2,500. I know we can do it. I know we can do it. It's not whether or not we can do it. It's whether or not we're going to do it. It's whether or not we're going to actually get to a point to where we respond to the challenge in front of us. Whether we rise to meet that challenge. Whether we step out on the battlefield or we sit back and point fingers and hold signs. You've got to get in the race. You've got to get in the fight. You've got to understand how things work. You know, I could see trepidation if I'm some cat that just popped up the last six months to a year. I've been doing this thing before social media started. I finally decided to jump on social media 2010. And I've been very consistent in my work and my message. I've given more, I've given way more of me in money and time than I probably ever get in any percentage close in support. I'll continue to do it because it's my love, it's my passion. But I'm going to continue to challenge people to stand up. What are you doing? What are you involved in? We have to stop working against ourselves I can't stress that enough we have to stop working against ourselves we have to start building I'm gonna say I, I said this in 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 the conversation I had on uh the I changed the narrative podcast on generational wealth on uh Saturday Actually, the young brother who was there also uh, had a version of it that he shared. But I've been saying this for years. Until we get to a point to where we're willing to plant seeds that we may not live long enough to see come to fruition, we're just talking. What does that mean? We got to put some skin in the game. We got to start protecting our children. We got to invest in programs that give our children a better chance. Right now, our children are walking out into a slaughter because we haven't prepared them. You can't send them to their schools and expect them to educate them to compete against theirs. Come on. I'm challenging you. Let's make today different. We need to raise $2,500 today. It's a fraction of what it costs to run this operation. But it's my challenge to you. I'm calling you. I'm challenging you. Let's make it happen. On that note.